speaking today on faithfulness. And just to I'll read some passages, I will draw from two examples whose light have been shining throughout the ages that we can borrow from because God wants our light to shine. He doesn't want us to, God has lit us as light to go around displaying him. And so we just have to play a part. And so I'm going to draw from a couple of people in the Bible whose light really shone bright while they were living and the light keeps shining as we read their stories. And I believe God, see, the, the, the book is continually being written and God wants a light to be shining so that when they read about you 200, 400, 500 years in the Lord tarries from now, they can say, yes, Rebecca was a light that was shining in education in the UK in the 220, 220 whatever period. Amen? Amen? And I want us to just take note of what we're going to be sharing today because I believe some of us need, need to be reminded. Perhaps we started to let our light shine, but sometimes along the line, something comes to want to derail you. God wants you back on track. And perhaps some of us need to hear this for the first time and get on the track because that is God is holding our hands and wants us to journey with him. Because when you look through the Bible, the, 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 the guy who wrote Psalm 23, he was, he was not in a cool place, <laughs> okay, all the time. But he had a perspective of the God who is able to see him through and the same God is still is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And um, and then we will then conclude by making a commitment, each one of us to to really go for it. We'll draw a few lessons from these personalities and use that as a linchpin to our own work. And perhaps you just need to add one or two things to how you've been uh, navigating your work in God. And just be, because God wants you to finish well. Amen? Amen. God wants each one of us to finish well. Amen. It's, not, it's, not, it's not difficult to start any journey. When you look at, when you, uh, I watch sport, uh, athletics captain can bear uh, witness to that. You, you can line 100 people up to run 100 meters. And then when you look at the end, you're going to have only a few finishing in good time. Anybody can crawl in there, but <laughs> so but God wants us to finish well. And that's why we come to church every Sunday. Church is uh, like a hospital. It's like a boot camp. It's like a hospital training ground where we get trained for the real life. And so I'm going to be sharing on cultivating faithfulness in our everyday life. We ready? Yes. So let's read a couple of passages together. The first one is going to be from... Hebrews 3. It says, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what will be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. And we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Hebrews 3, 5 and 6. And then we read from Proverbs 20, verse 6. It says, many declare their loyalty, but who can find someone truly faithful? The people of God said, yes, you can find someone truly faithful in God's house. Amen? Amen. You might not find people who are faithful in the world, but we have God's DNA and we can be faithful. And then in 1 Corinthians 4, it says, Verses 1 and 2. Thus, let a person consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. In this case, moreover, it is sought in stewards that one be found faithful. That one be found faithful. You, therefore, from 2 Timothy chapter 2. You, therefore, my child, 
That is Paul writing to his disciple, his child, uh, son in, in, in the Lord. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these things to faithful people who will be competent to teach others also. So God loves faithfulness. In fact, God is declared as a faithful God. One of the songs we were singing talked about God who is faithful, the first song we sang. And, you know, when we look at our God who is faithful and we look at ourselves who are his children, it's always good for children to look like parents. And it's always good for parents to tell children to come and tell, give testimonies. <laughs> okay? Because it's good to, to, to reflect our Heavenly Father. So if God is faithful, we can be faithful. And that's why when Proverbs 26 says, who can find a faithful person? The answer to us in church is, yes, you can find me. Yes, we can find you. And so we walk towards that because we, we operate from a standpoint of victory in Christ. You know, Jesus has made it possible for us to be everything God wants us to be. And we are just aspiring, we're just learning, we're just yearning to be exactly that. And so when you come to church, every little thing that's been done, even today, is a progressive way of getting you into that mindset of where God wants you to be. You are the light of the world. You cannot light something and put it under the bushel. You know, it's been demonstrated through song, through activities, and we've got to take that out. How can I let my light shine? You should be asking yourself. Because you are getting that truth. Because that is who you are. You may not be there yet. But when you hear, you can be converted. You can have a change of mind. And aspire to be what God has destined you to be. And so that is why it's so important. Because faithfulness is needful in our personal lives. And in the characters that I'm going to be sharing on, the faithfulness they cultivated while nobody was looking stood them in good stead when they had to confront some issues of life. Faithfulness is needful in our relationships, in our marriages, Faithfulness is needful in serving God. You hear the two passages I read about Paul to his disciples. God wants you to be faithful. In fact, Paul was saying that when you don't commit things of God to people that are not going to be faithful. So when, as you're hearing this message today, it means that you are the faithful ones. Amen? Because if God didn't think it was necessary for you and I to hear this, he would not speak to us this way. And faithfulness is needful in serving others. So what does faithfulness of faithful mean? Without boring you too much, it just means loyalty. It means trust. It means dependability. It means reliability. So when you say someone is faithful, it means that they can be trusted. It means that they can be depended on. It means that they're loyal. And God has demonstrated his loyalty to us. He gave covenants, he gave words over to and through his prophets in the Old Testament, and he delivered. And I, in my little brain, the way I process that is that if God could prove his faithfulness by sending Jesus, what can he not do to bless me? Because it's very difficult to, I, I live in, in the space where I have found myself. 
I don't want to live another person's life. So when, that's why, you know, the gospel says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved the world. You know, the whole world is qualified to be born again. The whole world is qualified. <laughs> but I want to announce to you, some people have elected otherwise. And you and I who have found ourselves in the body of Christ, we made a choice because we trusted God. We trusted that God is faithful. He's dependable. He's trustworthy. And so when we heard the gospel, we believed it. When our sister said, when I'm in difficult situation and I hear, I, I read that some, I don't just want his goodness to follow me. I want it to chase me. Hello? Amen. Which means I'm expectant. Mm -hmm. I live my life with that expectancy that God's goodness is going to be chasing me everywhere I go. That's why I never for one, you know, since I discovered that truth, I don't let people put me down. And one of the characters we're going to see here is going to show you that don't just let people, because people are, I mean, the enemy is take people in places to want to put you down. Have you noticed that? You know, when you think you're on top of the world, something just comes up and it wants to just cut you down. But when you know the truth, you just stand on that truth and say, here I am. This is what I believe because my God is dependable, because my God is faithful. And the same way God is faithful to you by ensuring that his promises will come to pass in your life, he wants you to be able to hold on to those promises. And that's what we're going to discover in a moment about these characters. I mean, the characters are no-brainers. I mean, some of you have already guessed who they are. But I, one of them is called Caleb. Caleb was one of the two spies, two spies who brought the good report. In Numbers 13 and 14, when Moses, when the people of Israel were entering the promised land. You know, the promised land in the Old Testament is similar to the kingdom of God in the New Testament. That was a precursor. That was preparatory for us to understand how the kingdom of God works. And so when they were entering the promised land, God instructed Moses in Numbers 13 to send spies to, to, to spy out the land they were about to possess, Canaan. And Moses chose 12 people, 12 leaders from the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent them into to spy the promised land, give them some specific instructions. They knew that God had delivered them from Egypt. I mean, if you were part of that group, you will see signs, you will have seen signs and wonders. Not because they were good enough, not because they were able but because God was faithful. And so God was teaching them so that he can teach us. He was asking them to, to he was asking Moses to send spies to the land to, to survey the land, to see what is it going to look like when we're going to, it's like God says, I want to give you something, but I want you to go and see it first. And then when you see it, you can make up your mind whether you want it or not. And boy, <laughs> Ten of, them, ten of them came back and said they saw what they saw. They said it was a land, a cool land. It was a good land. It was a fruitful land, a prosperous land. Then they saw some giants still living in the land. And then they said we saw the giants. And then when they came back to give their report, they gave the report of how the situation was where they were spying. But then they embellished it with their own thoughts. Because God said to them, I'm sending you to possess this land. I have given you this land. You know, God doesn't speak. I mean, when God speaks, it's like it's, it's, it's already happened. So God has already, had already given them the land. And he was asking them to just go and figure out how they were going to. What, it's like, figure out what spot you're going to take when you get in there. And then they came back and began to embellish them over. And they said something which was interesting. And some of, some, uh, something, some, uh, Rebecca alluded to that this morning. They said, 
we saw some giants in the land. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight. And also, that's how we looked to them. Did you get catch what they said? They saw giants. Well, they might have thought that they were like grasshoppers, which means they were like ants before the giants. But they didn't know how the giants view them. But then they said, we felt or we, we, we knew that the, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. And then when the people they were reporting to her that, fear grew them. What? It's like, what are we doing here? And then they mutilate against Moses because why did you bother to leave, take us out of Egypt to come and kill us here? Because of the bad report of a few. Because they move the people to fear. I mean, isn't that what the news tells most of us most times? They're going to kill all of us. COVID was going to kill every one of us who have been told. Right? And so on and so forth. And so, but Caleb stood up and said, let us go at once to possess the land. We are able because God has promised us is able because he trusted in the God who is loyal. If God said he was already giving us that land, that meant it was a done deal. Amen? And I think it's important for us to understand that. And that is why God really sort of was impressed with Caleb. And he described him as a faithful servant. Because he had another spirit. God says in Numbers 14, 24. He had a different spirit to those, 13, to those, those 10 spies. Who saw the same thing that uh, Caleb saw, Caleb and Joshua. But then they came back, and because they, they, instead of holding on to the promise of God, they were holding on to what they could see. They forgot the promises of God. And I want to say, you see, some of us, myself included, sometimes we forget the promises of God. Because we think, how am I going to cross this hurdle? How am I going to, face, how am I going to get through this, this challenge? But you forget that God says he is the ever-present help in time of trouble. Amen. The promises of God that you have learned over the years, that is when those promises should be coming back to say if God could do it then, he can still do it now. Amen? And I saw it's so important to see because Caleb demonstrated with his courage and his faith in God that it's good to trust in the word of the Lord. Amen? And the Bible says, he was fully committed to following the God of Israel. But let me read it out to you because I think sometimes it's good to, to read what the Bible says, uh, not just think I'm making it up. <laughs> okay? In Numbers 14, 24, this is God, when God had sanctioned those, those 10 people, 10 spies, and said, he actually judged them and said, they will not inherit that land. You see, every time we, we, we call God a liar, you know what? We are cutting ourselves off from his covenant because God wants to be trusted. You see, faith is the thing that impresses God. You see, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In Hebrews 11, we have a catalog of people who please God by their faith. Even Rahab. Rahab, you know, Rahab's trade was she was a prostitute. But you know what? Because of her faith, she became one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. How about that? I mean, those people who thought they were holier than thou, you know, they, they, you know, they were holier than thou in hell because of unbelief. Sorry, I used some graphic words. <laughs> okay. But the important thing is that God wants you to trust his word. And in Numbers 14, 24, he says, but because my servant Caleb had a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. What a promise. God said, just because he was able to trust my word, 
he will inherit that land. He will inherit that promise. He will, he will, God will bring him. And when you look at the back end of Caleb's life, at 85, at 85, he was as strong as he was at 45. Because after many things had happened, he still remembered again God's promise. And he went to Joshua, who had become the leader of the people at that time, and said, what about the land that Moses promised me when I will survey the land together? It's time for me to take over, to take that land. And of course, Joshua remembered, and he gave him. And at 85, the Bible said he was strong, he was as zealous to want to possess that promise as he was at 45. Amen? Amen? So there's no age barrier. None of us is too old or none of us is too young. In fact, the young ones, you just have a long street of faithfulness ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Amen? And our prayer in this church is that, you see, you see what some of us oldies have not been able to do. You can do them and enjoy life and enjoy life and enjoy life, you know, for the stretch ahead of you. That's why this message is also for you. God wants you to be faithful. Amen? So, Caleb demonstrated the fact that it was important to be faithful to God. Faith pleases God. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long it takes. God is able to fulfill his word. Amen? And then the next character is our man, David. David was just a normal person showing up for normal life. I remember, you remember David was the eighth son of Jesse. And he was, he just, was just an ordinary normal person, young person. And one day, normal life brought him into an extraordinary opportunity. But because we always hear the story of David with David confront, from confronting Goliath, you know what? He didn't just show up to defeat Goliath there had been unseen preparation before that time. And that is why everyday life matters. You don't just become something you are becoming. Because when life's challenges or opportunities come, the question is, are you ready? And David answered that question. Because as a young man, you know, in the family, he had the assignment which nobody envied. He was asked to go and look after the sheep, the few sheep that the father had. So he was there tending the sheep as a young boy. You know, and his brothers were being trained for war. But he didn't moon at least from what we could read from his account, he could have said, oh, why me? Why put me in the sheepfold? Why don't I have the opportunity to, to be where other people were, my older brothers? Even when Saul, when, when Saul messed up and God wanted Samuel to anoint a new king for Israel, David was not invited. That showed how important he was. Because if he was important, he would have been invited. So he was overlooked everywhere. But you know, David's name actually meant beloved. But that didn't look like beloved. <laughs> when God was going to anoint king, you kept the beloved in the garden and brought the good looking, tough, hefty, you know, guys forward. Even Samuel was almost beguiled because he said, oh, surely the Lord's hand is on this one, one coming. And God said, no, no, no. Say, I don't look on the outside. I look on the inside. When he had gone through the seven older brothers and all of them were not accepted, then Samuel had to ask Jesse, have you got another son? He said, oh, ah, yes. I remember there's one young lad who is keeping the sheep. Samuel said, go bring him. 
and he anointed him. That was the Lord's choice. But what made David to qualify? I believe David was faithful. He had a few sheep to look after. He was faithful with little things that he had. He didn't despise those small beginnings. He didn't say, well, you know, I want the big, I want to be in the military. I want to be where the big boys are. You know, he kept his focus and he was looking after the sheep. And even his testimony said, when a lion and a bear tried to steal one of the sheep, I killed him. <laughs> Listen, David was perhaps 16, 17 at that age. A 16 year old killing a lion, he must have something that some of us need to, to know. But it was his devotion, his faithfulness to even those sheep I was looking after that made him to go the extra mile. You could have just said, lion, just take your pick and go and hide himself away. Or bear, you just do what you want to do. I want to protect my life. But he put his life on the line and he rescued those sheep. Amen? He was doing what some of us need to be doing when nobody's looking. Because sometimes, you know, we, we, we like people to know what we're doing. <laughs> you know, it's just one of, that's what you read in the newspaper. You see someone who is just giving five pounds to a cause. And then they say, come on, put me on the front page. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Hello? Out of millions, you give 500 pounds and then you think you've done a lot? The millions did not work for? <laughs> That's another story. But David was faithful. Even when his father, I mean, he was faithful to his father. In spite of all, you know, the father overlooked him. This is my own reading to it. When he the time for anointing, he could have taken an offense that you overlooked me. Now I'm not going to do anything again. When the father asked him to go give food to his brothers in the war front, you know what he did? Not only did he obey his father, he also left those sheep with someone else to look after them. That is faithfulness. You know, the little that is given to him, he wasn't going to let it miss. You know, I read the story of Colin um, Powell, the former U.S. general, who, who became the first black uh, military head in the U.S. And he, I, I just read that book, and he said, he said he had a lot of issues when he was in the military. But he made up his mind, any little corner you give me, I'm going to make it look the best. So when they degrade him, sometimes they would demote him and it's like his light was shining. He, he was shining in that corner. It's like some of us, Christians. In your office, not everybody's gonna like you because you're Christians, I tell you that. In fact, you announce that you're Christian, you invite trouble, <laughs> okay, in some places. But Colin Powell said, when they put me in one corner, I made that sure that that corner was the best. I invested in those people. He was leading the best he could. That moved me on to say, wow, that, nothing just happens. You think David just came out and killed Goliath just like that? No, David had proved himself faithful. So when the opportunity came, David stepped up. He showed up. And God wants you and I to show up every day. What is your own setting? What is your own setting? Is it in a family situation where everybody in the family, nobody wants to hear you when you speak because you're a Christian? Don't take it too personal. They did the same to your Lord, okay? Did you know that? The peop his people killed him. Well, out of ignorance. So instead of us whining, instead of taking offense, I mean, I never read anywhere where David took an offense against anyone. In fact, his brother, when he was giving food to, the, to, to, the, to, to them on the war front, Eliab, his brother, when David was asking questions, when he said, 
anybody who kills this giant, what is going to be the prize? And he said, you marry the king's daughter. Wow. <laughs> what an incentive. From a pauper to become the king's <laughs> in-law, son-in-law. What, what a deal. And then he said, your family will be absorbed from paying taxes. Really? So we're going to live tax-free? I'm ready. You know where Eliab came on the scene and said, what are you doing here? Where have you kept those few sheep that you were asked to look after? You know, David could have really stood up to him and said, let's go. But you know what David did? He turned away. Because he wasn't going to let anybody derail him from his destiny. He needed to hear what God was saying through Saul, who was the king, who will bless the person who killed Goliath. And he's, he's calculating in his head at a young age. So if I kill Goliath, this Goliath, by the way, this Goliath, you know what it is? He's defying the armies of God. David also understood the principle that some of us in the body of Christ need to take heed of. We are covenant people. We are covenant people. Yes. You know, class 101, what is a covenant? Covenant is someone who is big and mighty coming into alliance with someone who is just not there and saying that everything at my disposal, I'm putting at your disposal. If you can just come into agreement with me, when you are attacked, I bring my full force on you. It's like those who are NATO members, if any of the NATO members is attacked, the full force of NATO comes on the attacker. I mean, this war in Ukraine would have ended if Ukraine was part of NATO. Did you get that? Because NATO is powerful. Alliance of nations with mighty weaponry. And you attack one, you attack all. So that's what covenant is. You attack someone in covenant with God, God comes after you. David understood that. So he was listening to Goliath describing, ridiculing the people of God. And he's looking in, in, in his book to say, this, this, we are God's people, as we Christians are, God's kingdom people. And so the devil is threatening you to annihilate you. And then you're letting him have the day. No, no, you just need to say to him, you know what? My king is the victor. My king is on the throne. You just need to let him hear that name of Jesus we are singing about. That name. There's power in that name. There's power in that name. Demons flee at the name of Jesus. Captives are set free. You just need to be convinced yourself. Because if you are not convinced, it won't work. You have to have that conviction. That I believe in the name of Jesus. The name above every name. So when you are threatened by the threats, Empty threats, by the way, of the devil, just need to let him know the truth. Yes. And when you confront him with the truth, you know what? He flees as if in terror. And that's why we need to school ourselves in the truth. You know, read, go and read the story of David, go and read the story of, uh, of, of Caleb and Paul and many others and see how they navigated this life because nothing new is under the sun. There's nothing new. It's just a skill. Perhaps things are more real. You know, when someone is about to take you down, you can read it on the internet straight away. <laughs> okay? It's even good information for you because you just know, need to know. But in those days, it, it takes ages. When Saul wanted to kill David, it took Jonathan, Saul's son, you know, different methods to try to get his attention. But now, it's real time. Amen? And real-time warfare demands real-time readiness. You and I have got to be ready. That's why we must be prayed of every day. Every day, spend time praying before God. That's how you build yourself, you build faithfulness in God. Because, you see, to trust God, you need to trust him at his word. And when you pray, one of the things prayer does to, to us is that he helps us to believe because when you see, the, the reason why we do testimonies in church every Sunday is so that you can be encouraged in your faith. Could God do that? Yes. If God could deliver that person, 
I am next in line. Amen? Amen. So we've got to prepare ourselves. Pray, read the Bible, believe it, meditate it. Think about it. Psalm 123. Psalm, Psalm 23. What does he say to me? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my, not just Obi shepherd, my shepherd as well. So I have to personalize it. I don't have to let it be just the good people who have all the good goodies. No, I qualify as well. It's my shepherd. And what does that mean? That means I have to be a good sheep. I have to be a listening sheep. How to be a sheep who keeps within the sheepfold. Because when you leave the sheepfold, you are opening yourself to threats. Amen? So you have to be within the confines of where the shepherd can look after you. And you have to listen to his voice. When he says, move this way, that's when you move. Because God wants to speak to his people. He wants us to hear his voice. One of the ways God trains us is by his voice. You know, in Numbers 14, 24, you remember it says, Caleb had another spirit. I believe he was moved, he was listening to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And we in the New Testament, we have that with us permanently. In the Old Testament, it came upon them as God, you know, wills. Now the Holy Spirit is resident within you and I. And so you just need to let the Holy Spirit bring, you know, convince you, you know, convict you, teach you, guide you, help you. You know, that is the way it works. That is how you, you, you become faithful. You, you develop faithfulness every day. You read a, a Bible verse, you say, how does that apply to me? If you read someone else's testimony, oh, this is how that brother applied this. I can apply that as well. And then you begin to figure out how you can apply it to your situation. Okay? Because this is real life. While David was in that place where he was looking after sheep, he developed how a relationship with God, trust in God, dependability on God. He was able to see God in action. If God could, if I could tear up a lion with my bare hands, oh boy, <laughs> I've, I've got some stone. This is Goliath. I know David, he practiced his, his, his stuff while he was there. That was when he was rehearsing. He was practicing. He didn't just say, oh, I'm going to kill him with uh, give me five stones and I'll, I'll just do that. No, 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 no. He knew how to do a marksman. You know, how to, he, that was what he knew. He didn't have a gun like his brothers or whatever they were using in those days. But what he had, he had perfected it. And you and I, what you have, you have to perfect it. When nobody's looking, you have prayer, you have the word of God. I mean, you have testimonies of other people. You have even the encouragement of other people and you have the support of people. When you have need prayer, you know, the, the, the one of, when I became a Christian, this is a secret, open secret. I couldn't pray. But I had a friend. He was streets ahead of me. Whenever I needed answer to prayer. Because I read Matthew 18. He says, if any of you shall agree as touching anything on earth, God will do it for you. I knew this brother could pray. And I could trust him. He will pray properly. He's not just someone who just I'll pray. When I knocked on his door, we stood in agreement. And I, for about a year or two, I started seeing answers to prayer. I said, boy, this thing works. Oh, boy, we're going to use this. Not only did I, when I, and then I was knocking on everybody's door. You need any agreement? I'm ready. I'm serious. I'm ready to support you. You need agreement on anything? Let us go, because our God says, if two of us agree as touching anything that we ask here on earth, he will answer. And we saw things happen. And we still see things happen. So we have all those support systems. Let's use them. That develops our faith in God. It develops us into trusting God. And then we ourselves can then become faithful. And so how does that matter to us as I close? So we have learned that faith is important to God. Commitment to God is key. But we've got to be courageous. You've got to step up. You can know all of these things, and when there's time to act, you just go into your shell. No, no, it's not going to work that way. The things of God don't just fall on us. I mean, I wish they did. Life would be a lot smoother. 
But we're going to possess it. You know, God told the children, I want you to go in and possess the land. Our one is even a lot easier. We don't have to carry guns to possess the land. We just need to trust. I mean, and that is where things need to happen. We need to believe in our heart that God is able. And we need to have that courage to step forward. When our brother was saying, I, I, I believe I'm going to stand and help those people who have to, because life is tough in this country right now. Hello? A lot of people are going to find it difficult to navigate this next season. But where there's help, I want to be in the forefront to help someone in whatever way I can help them. That is being faithful. That is your own way of being faithful. And in church, you know, this is God's house. This is God's house. We need courageous people to step forward, to man our PA, to do everything we're doing. To, because, you see, to make it easy for us to be trained, to be reminded, to be bound, bound up, you know, like if we are sick, for God to heal us, to create that environment where the power of God can move, where the presence of God can be resident. That's why this is an oasis. Have you ever noticed that, see, I mean, I love it when I hear of problems. Not that I want it, okay? But I know that it's an opportunity to prove God. Because God is real, and you're all sure. But we need to be courageous. We need to step up and step forward to say, count me in. Amen? And then we need to be led and inspired by the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this on your own. You know the power of the Spirit. Just like Caleb had another spirit to the spirit of the world. And I tell you, this world is being led astray by the spirit of the world, spirit of the age. But those who are God's children, who have the spirit within them, are the ones who are going to make it. Are the ones who are going to be... And time is coming when they are going to knock on your door. Don't call me a prophet of doom. Because they need help. That's why it's so important for you to prepare yourself. And when you are the only one who is shining, whose light is shining, why wouldn't they come? So get ready. Say with me, I'm going to get ready. I'm going to get ready. And if faithfulness means learn to serve well in whatever tasks you are given. I'm closing with this. In Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your strength. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your strength. For there's no work, planning, knowledge, or wisdom in the grave where you're heading. So whatever our hand finds to do, let us do it mightily. And don't wait until the big thing happens. You know, I know people, some people say, well, when that church becomes 500, then I can join. <laughs> Hello? If you don't join when it's five, you're not going to join when it's five million. Exactly. Because people are looking for, I mean, I'll go to that prayer meeting when I can have 100 people there. What if the quota is two? <laughs> God says two. You says 500. And God says, I just need two people. You know, Jesus used 12 people to turn the whole world around. And we are looking for masses before we join. Those who are waiting for so you are never going to do anything. I just tell you straight away. Because the devil is lying to you and you are believing that lie. You know, this is the time we had Obi's testimony. He Obi is our chief of operations. He wasn't here for a few weeks, and I was sweating <laughs> every Sunday. I'm serious. <laughs> because how are we going to go through? But he shared his testimony. Do you mind me saying it? He said he had someone in the church who's not even in the church right now, who just shared why they joined in to do something for God. And he reflected over it, and he said he never looked back. That story moved him. That 
if this person could volunteer to serve God, you can't mean it. I can say it more. <laughs> but let's start. <laughs> you know, God is looking up to you. Say we mean God is looking up to me. God is looking up to me. To be faithful. To be faithful. Because he's looking for faithful people. For faithful people. To get his job done. And I sign in. I sign up. This day. I will be found faithful. As a steward and as a servant of Jesus Christ. Whatever my hand finds to do, I am going to do it well. I'm going to apply all my strength to do it because that's my calling. That is God's expectation of me. And I want to please my Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.